All right, well, welcome everyone to Women on Wealth. This is Jelena again, and I have a very unique guest on today, uh, Steve Chavarone, who is a portfolio manager at Federated Hermes, and he's the head of multi-asset solutions, which I believe is managing about 600 billion today. And he's responsible for the formulation of Federated Hermes views on the economy, financial markets, and the firm's investment positioning and strategies. He also has been a regular contributor across the media, including CNBC's Squawk Box, Worldwide Exchange, Power Lunch, Trading Nation, Nightly Business Report, and Fast Money, and then Fox Business Network's Morning with Maria, Countdown to the Closing Bell, and Bloomberg's Daybreak America, uh, and also has been featured in Reuters, Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, New York Times, and CNN Money. So... He clearly has a lot of opinions that people want to hear about on the markets today, um, but we're going to actually do a bit of a different conversation because he has also been responsible for a lot of research um, that I believe he's going to talk about is getting some recent attention um, that's titled Respect, the Ascendancy of Millennials and How the Future of Finance is More Female. So after all that, Stephen, thank you for joining. Nice to see you. It's a heck of an introduction. Thank you. <laughs> so the first question we have to ask is that you are, you're a successful portfolio manager. You've been successful in running all these assets. You have your opinion about the markets, but we're, we're talking about something a little different today. Can you explain how you got into this research? Yeah, I think it is, um, it's dangerous when you're trying to run money and navigate markets to always focus on the immediate, um, the next data point, what the market's doing today. I, I think it's the equivalent of trying to navigate an ocean by looking at the next wave, right? Mm -hmm. you, 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 need a, you need a centering point, you need a buoy, you need a, a map, you need GPS, you need something that's bigger. Um, and so I, I try to, as a rule of thumb, spend some time each year thinking about longer term narratives. Um, the longer term environment. And what, what the research we're going to talk about today was born out of was our, our understanding of kind of secular bull and secular bear markets. And what we found is that secular bull markets, which are not the absence of recessions, secular bull markets have recessions. They have pullbacks, right. um, 20, 30% pullbacks. But there are periods where the market is moving to higher highs and higher lows over an extended period of time. Anytime the market takes a hit, you're making your money back and moving higher within two years. It contrasts that to the kind of 2000 to 2013 period where, you know, if you didn't sell the market top in 2000, it was 13 years before you made money again, right? That's a secular bear. Right. And what we found is that in secular bulls, you've got two things that are going on. You have technology that are driving uh, earnings higher and demographics that are driving multiples higher. And as we looked at the secular bull that we think started in 2013, the technology was clear. It was what we're doing right now, right? Advanced telecommunication, automation, AI, robotics, all of that. But the, the driving demographic force was the rise of the millennials. Millennials are 15 million bigger than the baby boomers ever were. It's the largest generation in the history of the US. And we're feeling impacts from this generation everywhere, be it in home ownership right now, or just pop culture. There isn't a movie that isn't a throwback to a cartoon from the 90s, right? Yeah. It's all about the millennials. Right. So the question was, who are these people? And not just who are they in terms of popular culture, but who are they economically? Who are they as, in, as, in, as investors? And that's what we were focusing on. Now, when I did that, I had zero expectation that I was going to craft a story about women. I did not know going into that, that the story of the millennial generation financially is a story about women. I wasn't intending that to be the case. I wasn't setting out to do women's research, mm -hmm. but the data kept pointing in that direction. So we pulled on that string. Um, and that's- and Stephen, that's when did you start important. the research? What's that? How far back does this research go now? So we started doing this uh, in 2019. So, okay. well, actually 2018. 2018, we started with this idea of the secular bull and the demographics and the technology. That's when we wrote it. It was an idea that had been kind of germinating for a couple of years, even before that. Right. And then it was 2019 where, where, where we made the decision to dig into 
the millennials. And I, I was so worried because we came out with this research at the tail end of 19. I was expecting to use it a ton in 2020 because people respond really well to this. Um, and then when COVID hit, I thought it was going to get lost. And somehow it broke through. It's, it's continued to gain traction. People found it even during COVID. And uh, I think it's as relevant now as it was when we first wrote it. I, well, I would absolutely agree. And, and um, before you move on, if you can take a second and talk about secular growth, because we may have some listeners that have never really heard of this concept before. Yeah. Um, and I, we're living in a market right now, we're, we're recording this in 2020 when the media is doing nothing but talking about when we're going to enter this next recession. The markets have struggled this year. So, so can you talk a, a little bit more about that piece? Yeah. So secular bull market, secular bear market, how does that differ from what you hear? I mean, if you listen to some of those esteemed networks that you mentioned that I've, you know, uh, joined <laughs> from time to time, you know, every time the market's down 20%, they call it a bear market, right? Right. Every time it's moving up, they call it a bull market. And look, th that, that may be true in, in those short-term definitions. The problem is, is none of us really understand what the next 5% move in the market is likely to be. I mean, we have guesses, but the uncertainty over the short run is just way, way, way too high. If you take a step back and you look at equity markets, what you'll find is that they generally operate in two regimes, long-term flat and long-term up. There is no long-term down, right? There's no example of a market consistently falling for 20 years. It just right. doesn't do that. What you'll see is it'll sh fall sharply for one or two years. It'll stay low and then it'll start to recover and it'll take quite a bit of time to get back to the old highs. That, that's kind of long-term flat. Right. And it's really important that you understand which regime you're in. I, I like to think about it, you know, in terms of the advice of my mom and my dad. In a secular bear market, you need to get out before you're kicked out. You need to leave the party before you're kicked out. So if you're approaching a market high and then it rolls over, it may be many years until you get back to that old market high. So in 1929, if you didn't get out, you didn't make your money back to 1954. If you didn't get out in 1973, you didn't make your money back until 1980. If you didn't get out in 2000, you didn't make your money back until, until 2013. In a secular bull, you want to listen to my father's advice, which is don't leave the party before the good parts come. <laughs> and here, right, you can have market dislocations like the stock market crash of 1987. It was painful. The market fell 30% in one day. Right. If you sold, you missed 13 more years of bull market after that date. Yeah. Um, and so there are things that you can do to identify which you're in. For example, secular bull markets have on average three recessions, three 20% declines and a 30% decline. They have never had a decline of greater than 35% in a secular bull. Secular bears regularly have 40 and 50% pullbacks. So when you think about the market and what kind of downside is in place. And so you know, we, we have contended, and, and the market has responded this way, that we exited a secular bear in 2013. That was when the S&P finally um, surpassed the 2000, 2007 double top. And we've been in a secular bull since. And then that influences how we think about pullbacks and how much downside we assess and, and what kind of investment strategies we want to put in place. No, that's, that's great. Thank you for that clarification. And, and so kind of going back to where you started with this, you were talking about a secular bull market being driven by technology and then by demographics being millennials. Yes. So, so can you talk a little bit about first, who are the millennials? Yeah. So it's weird because, you know, as, sometimes as we get older, our frames of reference don't change. Yeah, totally. So, you know, when, when, when millennials were first used as a term, these were college kids, you know, that for older generations, they found you know, quite annoying sometimes. So here's the thing that I would, I would remind everyone. Never in the history of people has one generation looked at a younger generation and said, wow, I really like their choices. I love their music. I love the way they dress. I love the way they live their life. It just doesn't work that way. So there's always intergenerational friction. That, that's a starting point. 
who millennials are, are folks born between 1980 and 2000. So the youngest millennial today is 22 years old, having just graduated college. Uh, the oldest millennial is 42 years old, you know, well within the, the, the kind of prime of their lives. 60% of the generation will hit the age of 30 between the years 2020 and 2030. So the bulk of the generation is right around 30 right now. That, that's the bulk of the generation. Um, this generation is um, the most educated generation in history. So millennials are far more likely than prior generations to have a bachelor's degree or higher. It is the least white generation in the history of the US. So, you know, when you look at, and, and we've got the detailed numbers in, in the research, but when you look at kind of the peak birth years of the baby boom generation, you know, upwards of three quarters of the births were white. Um, here it's at or slightly below 50% in the peak birth years. Um, it's the largest generation in history by a wide margin. So the baby boomers peaked at about, you know, let's call it 77 million people. Um, the millennials are projected to peak at roughly 92 to 95 million. I say projected because the generation's young enough that immigration still exceeds the death rate. So a generation will grow as long as immigration exceeds the death rate. At some point, that stops and then it shrinks, but uh, yeah. that point's really not expected to be reached until 2038 or so. So this generation is still growing. Okay. Can I ask a follow-up question with that? When you talk about the millennials driving this secular bull market, my original response was, okay, they're the, you, they're the largest. So it, just from a pure number standpoint, they're going to drive that. Is there more to it? Yeah, there's two things. One, yes, they're the largest, right? So there's only X amount of companies. And if more people want to buy them, yeah. um, you know, that's part of driving multiples higher. The other part of it is, is the millennial lifestyle is different than prior generations. And it really centers around childbirth. Um, so baby boomers on average had their first child around 22 years old, um, give or take a year or two. Millennials have their first child on average around 28 years old. And so there's been a lot written about how the generations are different. They're really not as different as the research suggests. If you look at a 22 year old millennial and compare them to a 22 year old baby boomer, they look very different and they should because at 22, a baby boomer was married, had a kid and lived in a single family home with a white picket fence. At 22, a millennial, isn't going to get married and have a child for another six years. Right. So there's no reason for them to own the white picket fence. So that's different. They also, because they're the most educated generation in history, that means they're in school longer. That means they have more debt when they leave school. So they, they start their financial life later. What that means is that they have fewer years for their investments to grow. Okay. Right? A baby boomer would get out of high school. They'd start their family. They would start earning and saving and investing at 22, 23. They would have, let's call it 40 years to invest. A millennial doesn't start that until they're 31, 32. So now they've only got 30 years to invest. Well, let's do the math. If I want to retire at the same age and I want to have a similar lifestyle, but I have 10 less years to invest, I need a higher rate of return, don't I? Right. Well, where do I get that? Equities. I need more equities in my portfolio. In fact, the average baby boomer could reach their retirement goals investing in a portfolio that was 40% equities and 60% and bonds. Right. A millennial, given all the same metrics, same income, same retirement lifestyle, same retirement age, and the only thing you change is when they start, need a portfolio of 80% equities to get to the same place. Wow. So that, that later start creates a need for higher return, which pushes them into equities, which push up equity multiples, secular bull market. Got it. Thank you for clarifying that. And, and I think, unfortunately, what that comes with is more risk while you invest, more emotions around investing, which means we need more education around investing. 
it's going to be a more volatile ride because you have to take more risk to get there. Exactly. Exactly. And you also found uh, you did some research on the wage gap as well. Can you talk a little bit about that? I can't believe we still have to bring this up, but. Yeah, well, let, let's back up. What we found when we started digging in the millennials yeah. is that the reason that they're the most educated generation in history is because of women. Okay. So that Thank that you. was the key difference. It's not as though millennial males are necessarily more educated than prior generations, but a millennial woman is more likely to get an associate's bachelor's graduate or doctorate degree than her male counterparts. In fact, and this is cool because you're very rarely able to say something like this with certainty. A millennial woman is the single most educated human to ever live, period, full stop, without exception, you know, no, no, no qualifier on that. Now, she will be quickly uh, deposed from that position by millennial members of Gen Z, which is good. <laughs> up until now, this is the yeah. most educated person that's ever lived. Wow. Um, and there's all kinds of benefits for millennial women relative to prior generations. So for example, um, when a millennial woman gets a bachelor's degree or higher, her income goes up 85% on average. Um, in a millennial household, women are the primary asset owner when they enter the relationship half of the time. They are the primary or co-equal income earner in two thirds of households. They're the primary or co-equal financial decision maker in 62% of households. They're the primary or co-equal investment decision maker in 55% of households. Wow. That's never happened before. Big difference, yeah. It's hugely different. She also is more likely to have reached every financial milestone you can think of, whether it's buy a house, buy a car, have money for a family, all of that. So what you'll see is that within the millennial generation, the wage gap exists, but it's smaller. It's, you know, 85 cents on the dollar instead of, or 89 cents on the dollar instead of something that might be closer to 80 or 85 cents on the dollar. It hit parity during the great financial crisis. Men really took it on the chin in the great financial crisis because a lot of the jobs that were destroyed were housing laborers or things that are traditionally more male dominated. Sure. When you look at the millennial generation, so you know, there's pros and cons to this. When you control for a particular job, in general, within the millennial generation, the wage gap disappears. What you will still find is a higher preponderance of women in certain jobs that pay less, like being a teacher. Right. And a certain preponderance of men in industries that pay more like engineers. So it's really about mix shift, not necessarily about women in a like for like job being paid less versus her male counterpart in the millennial generation, not okay. in prior generations. And the reason why is she's now the majority of the college educated workforce. So on average, she enters the workforce better credentialed than her male counterpart, which wasn't the case in the past. Great. That's, that's amazing. Thank you. And what about, what about is women are, be, you know, achieving all these financial milestones, right? Mm -hmm. um, what's their confidence like during this? Well, that's the thing. Um, you know, women, it, it, it's classic. Um, surveys of males, particularly um, millennial men, what you will find is that generally their confidence around investing is high. And women in general demonstrate much lower, if you just ask a group of women, do you consider your financial or investment knowledge to be very knowledgeable, somewhat knowledgeable, not knowledgeable at all? Almost half of women will call themselves not knowledgeable at all. And something like two thirds or three quarters will say, um, you know, that they're only somewhat knowledgeable. Completely. However, right. however, there's another word for that that's called humility. And humility can be a virtue. So what you'll find, and this isn't just one study, this is cross-sectional study after study after study that has been done really since the 1970s. Because women tend to be less confident, they tend to trade less, they tend to focus more long-term, 
And ironically, that longer term focus gives them about you know, a 1% per year better investment return than their male counterparts. Um, but the story of female investing, unfortunately, right now, particularly amongst the millennial generation, is one of important insecurities. Insecurity about their investment acumen, insecurity about running out of money in retirement. Right. That's the big one, right? She's, she's going to live longer than her male counterparts on average. Uh, she still makes on average a little less. Um, and she starts investing later. That is a good recipe to run out of money in retirement. So that is an insecurity that, that drives her investment decisions. Right. And a, a yearning or desire to not just have more education around investing, but financial planning. If I'm worried about running out of money in retirement, that's not just about how my money grows, but about how I manage my finances in order to make sure that that doesn't happen. And so those really, really drive her uh, in a number of ways. And, and that came through in our research very, very clearly. That's amazing. And uh, I kind of looking through your, your research, I know that I'm missing a ton of uh, aspects to it, but is there anything that I haven't mentioned yet that you think um, is, is important for this discussion? I, th I think this, this, this retirement insecurity is, is really the big one. So remember, yeah. you know, she, she, she's more likely to get a college degree or higher than her male counterparts. It, it means that student debt is a female issue primarily. So two thirds of all student debt are held by women. Wow. I had no idea coming into this that that was the case. Um, which is kind of odd because even within my own household, my wife has a higher degree than I do and almost all of the student debt that we incurred. So I was living it, but I didn't internalize that as being, you know, the, 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 the norm. Sure. Um, because she's worried about retirement, because she has some insecurities about her investment knowledge, she's less likely to want to seek financial advice in an intimidating setting. She's not likely to accept your invitation to a three hour dinner at an Oak Line steak restaurant, to talk about all the things she doesn't know. Right. The perception of risk and our perception of her risk is oftentimes wrong. So you see a lot of times you'll see, you know, research that says, well, women are more risk averse. No, they're not. They just are solving for a different risk. Let me give you an example. If I were to say to you, you're not taking enough risk and I want you to buy more stocks because you're going to need to do that. And the way you're framing that to me is, well, I need to make more, take more risk and I'm going to have more volatility. I might be disinclined to want to do that. Mm -hmm. If, however, your focus is on running out of money in retirement and I run a number of scenarios and I say to you, look, at your current returns where your portfolio is, your risk of falling short is too high. We need to buy more stocks to get a better return so that we can decrease the risk that, that you're risk. gonna run out of money. She's more than willing to take that risk. Interesting, yeah. Absolutely more than willing. So the Monte Carlo simulation, scenario-based investing. You know, another thing that we found in the research, you know, when the market's volatile, Males are more likely to say, well, how did I do this year versus the market? How did I do versus peers? How much am I up? How much am I down? How much did I lose? Women are more likely to ask the question, am I still on track? Am I still likely to achieve my financial goals? And so right. that influences how you think about risk. In, and the other thing that's different here too, that's really important. This isn't her mom. So prior generations of females, not, and again, this is, these are all obviously gener generalizations, but as a generalization, prior generations of women tended to come into wealth after a divorce, the death of a spouse, or the death of a parent. Well, anyone who comes into their money after a traumatic life experience like that is going to be risk averse. Sure. That's not a millennial woman. She is, for lack of a better term, a badass. She did better in school. She got a great education. She went to work. She's yeah. 40 years old. She's crushing it. She's making a ton of money and it's hers. She made it and she's not at all risk averse relative to her male counterpart. So understanding that and then also understanding that because she's afraid that she's going to run out of money in retirement, she's unwilling 
to go through the normal life cycle of finance is what I would call it, right? So for a lot of people, I'm going to earn my money with whatever company will pay me the most money. And mm -hmm. then I'm going to spend it on goods from whatever companies sell goods that I like. And then I'm going to grow it by buying stocks of companies that are going to give me the highest return. And then when I retire and I'm settled, I'm going to take that money that I have left over and I'm going to give it to causes that I think will make the world better. Right. right. doesn't matter how I made it. doesn't matter how I grew it. This is when I'm going to be charitable and impact the world to make it better. Yeah. Millennial women don't think that way because she's afraid she's going to run out of money in retirement. She doesn't think there is going to be anything to give away. So she only wants to work for a company that reflects her values. She only wants to buy goods from companies that she thinks are good stewards of the world. Sure. She only wants to invest in companies that she thinks are good stewards. And that's her way of engaging in charitable giving. It's her way of having a financial voice. It's her way of trying to improve society and the environment, et cetera, because she doesn't think she's going to have it to give it away. That creates a much different relationship between millennial women and sustainable investing, ESG investing, than you see in either right. men or prior generations. And it all ties back to that retirement and security. Lots of population there. That, that's fascinating. Thank you. Um, Stephen, can I ask you to circle back on a comment that you made that I think is worth talking a little bit about? Um, you mentioned Monte Carlo simulations. So I'm going to guess that a lot of people listening aren't familiar with that term. Hopefully, if they're a client of my firm, they understand it because we use it and we talk about it every time we meet. Um, but you know, to your point about millennials starting later in life investing, and needing to have more in equities, right? Means you, you are taking more risk. What, what is Monte Carlo simulation? How does that help? Yeah, so I, I think it's the most, so it, it's interesting that you asked that question because as you know, we've never discussed this point before. So th this, this wasn't like a planned- That was not planned, sorry. This is not a planned <laughs> discussion or question. So, so but, but it's an important one. I've argued that the Monte Carlo simulation is maybe the single most important financial planning tool for millennial women. Because what you're doing is, is you're looking at a set of variables, how much income somebody has or how much they have to invest. And then you're taking things that you don't know, that you can't necessarily control, like how much the market's up or what different return streams could be or different levels of inflation or economic growth. And you're running hundreds, if not thousands of scenarios. Right. And you're determining in how many of those scenarios are you reaching a goal? Exactly. So over, you know, if, if, if basically if we were for, for folks that have ever played kind of fantasy sports or something like that, you're basically simulating the rest of your financial life a thousand times and asking in how many of those thousand times did you reach your goals? And if that number is very high, then you've got a high probability to, to, to believe that you're going to reach your goals. If it's low, then right. you've got some risk. Um, right. And again, if what I'm focused on is reaching my financial goals and not worried about generating the highest return this year or beating the market, that's critical because it gives me a frame of reference. It says to me, look, if in 30 or 40% of these simulations, I'm falling short because I haven't saved enough or I haven't generated a higher, high enough investment return, again, I'm going to think about risk differently. I'm going to say, okay, it doesn't matter to me that my portfolio is going to be more volatile. I've got 30 or 40 years. And by having more stocks in it, my chances of falling short went from 30% to 5%, right? right? Who wouldn't do that? Yeah. As opposed to in a vacuum saying, I want you to take a bumpier ride for the sake of it. Um, and I think it, 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 for somebody who has that longer term focus, it's a very, very powerful tool. No, that's fantastic. Thank you. I always think of, I always think of the stock market as being on an escalator with a yo-yo. That's the reality of the market, right? It goes up and down. We may say that the stock market will give you 8% over 10 or 20 years, but we know it's not in a straight line. So the Monte Carlo basically is simulating that, that path of return to get there, right? Yeah. And, and the key is, I mean, look, you know, what, what's... What Wall Street doesn't always like to admit is that prices are going to go up and, and stocks are a price. Um, in the long run, prices are really driven by two very simple things. 
do you have babies and do you make new things? That's really it, right? If, if you think about the simplest asset being a plot of land with cave people on it, the only reason that that land would be worth more is if one, there's more cave people. So you've got to split the same amount of land by more people, right? Uh, or you figure out how to farm that land and make corn. And so now you can sell corn, right? So it, it's really innovation and population growth. Sure. The answer is really simple. If you've got a long enough investment horizon, buy the highest risk stocks or just buy stocks in general, close your eyes, and 30 years later, collect your winnings. The problem is none of us are, are unemotional beings. And so of course, where we talk about asset allocation or different kinds of stocks and different kinds of bonds, it's to try to smooth out that ride so we don't panic and do something dumb like leave the plan. And I'm a big believer in that second part. I can create the most efficient portfolios in the world. The greatest investment portfolio that you don't follow is worse than a mediocre investment portfolio that you do follow. Right. And so when you think about this and you think about things like Monte Carlos, or you think about using income strategies that pay you a dividend, or you think about um, changing your asset allocation from time to time, or just calling calling you, Jul Julina, and talking about what's going on in the market and getting calm. Right. It's about controlling your behavior. The market is going to deliver the return over time. So long as we have babies and make new things, and I'm going to bet that we do those two things. <laughs> uh, the rest of it is about getting comfortable with that ride. And the Monte Carlo simulation is a scenario where you can say, okay, I've lived through a 10 or 20% correction like we've lived through just now, but guess what? My odds of reaching my goal are still greater than 95%. That's well, good. I'll be calm. Yeah. Absolutely. No, thank That's you so it. much for clarifying that. Uh, and, and my uh, last comment here, but it sounds like your research is getting uh, some more publicity. Is that fair to say? Yeah. So we've done some, so we've done some cool stuff with it. Um, I, I had an opportunity to publish it through CNBC, uh, Trading Nation. So you can find it on the web there. I shot a video um, and um, it, it may get published in a different form over the course of the next couple of weeks. I don't want to, I don't want to spoil it yet until we get the okay, but uh, that's great. Certainly once it's in, you know, we'll, we'll send it along to you and you can share it with folks. And then, you know, as a general rule of thumb, anytime I do a piece of research like this, I, you know, I'm, I'm a believer that um, you shouldn't have to be a professional investor to know what's going on with your money. And so all of my presentations or white papers, so this exists both in a presentation and a white paper that I've written, are available for all audiences. Uh, so anyone, you don't have to be an accredited investor. You can just be somebody who's interested. Um, you know, we can give you access to that. And is that on the is that on the federated website? It is somewhere, but okay. the best thing to do would be to reach out to, to Lori and, and then she can get it to you directly. No, absolutely. We'll take a look for it and see if we can add it into the show notes. So that's great. Stephen, thank you so much. Um, first, on your success as a manager through times like this, uh, we certainly appreciate that. And second, the fact that you're doing this research and you committed to it and you are, you are literally running around the country talking about this. I think that's fantastic. So thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I, uh, I'm passionate about it. I, again, I, I think if, if I had gone out and tried to write a women's presentation, I, I think it would have been inauthentic and pandering in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, and that's why, why I think I'm kind of so excited about it is that's not what I'm doing. Uh, right. I was trying to understand the economy and markets. I was following a thesis. I was digging into a generation and the data pointed me into you know, this scenario where women are primarily the owners of income and primarily the financial decision makers. Women now own more than half of all the stocks in the world, um, which, you know, hasn't existed prior. Um, and so, you know, when you think about a market, it is, you know, some fundamental earnings or interest rates or whatever multiplied by the buying and selling decisions of people. And for you know, from the beginning of time until now, those decisions were primarily made by men. They're right. not anymore. At least half of them are made by women right now, at least. And so I think you ignore that at your peril. That's not a social justice comment one way or another. It's an investment comment. And so you have to understand that. So I, I struggled 
with whether or not I was the right person to present this, thinking, well, you know, who the heck wants to hear this from me? And then I said, well, it, it kind of has to come from me because it's not about women. It is, but that's not what it's primarily about. It's about sure. the markets, sure. the economy. And it just so happens that the story of markets and the economy are increasingly a story of women. Um, and so why shouldn't I say that? Um, yeah. Well, I think it's amazing because I've, you know, I've been studying the markets myself for, you know, 25 years and I'm a woman and I've, I've done my own research on, on us as a demographic and I never quite put the two together in this way. So I think it's so fascinating. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. So I guess share. in summary, I'm, I'm thinking about the markets ahead. It's all about babies and new things. It's, all, it's what it's always been about. <laughs> it's always been about. Well, thanks, Stephen. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you.